Um, if not, we'll move on to um, Bill Ragsdale, uh, his first of two uh, talks. The first talk is uh, Radio Amateurs in World War II. So uh, take it away, Bill. Very good. As by way of a uh, quick introduction, let's see if I get the... Uh... There we go. Are we all aboard? Got the uh, pretty picture there. Somebody say yes. 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 Um, as a as a little tip, every time I use Zoom, I learn something. Uh, on a presentation like this that does a lot of talking. If you go to the top center of your screen, you'll see a little black square that says view option. And if you open that and click side by side, it will put the speaker's screen side by side with the, with the desktop. And it makes sometimes a lot easier, uh, especially if I have trouble hearing, it's nice to see the person's face, and see, see their lips move, helps the reading. So anyway, our first section we're gonna to talk today has essentially no, has, has no fourth content in it. Um, however, I've been studying World War II technology for about a year now and find this is a very fascinating topic and it leads into the fourth presentation which will follow. So we're gonna talk about ham radio operators in World War II, but those are the British operators, not the US. And I will notice the picture at the side with myself, 15 years old at a local ham radio club meeting learning Morse code. So let's, we're gonna be reviewing the technology of World War II, uh, focused primarily on England. The work on radar began in 1934 in a very crude way. They were using field disturbance in uh, shortwave uh, bands, typically uh, 40 uh, uh, meter wavelength, uh, seven megahertz. They set up a huge antenna, looked like a bed frame, and it was not the um, transmit and receive, but it was really just field disturbance, very primitive, but they made progress year by year by year leading up to about 1939. Another, key element was the uh, enemy radio interception. We'll talk a lot about that. The breaking of machine ciphers. The intelligence, intelligence distributed by radio. Um, toward the middle of the war, they developed teleprinter techniques that were encoded with a one-time pad. So they were totally unbreakable and they did uh, transmission to the field agencies by uh, printed message by teleprinter, which was a, was a big step above all other radio transmission. Another element was radio direction finding. This was high frequency direction finding, which was codenamed Huff Duff. So I did some of the background earlier on this, and I'll just touch on it very briefly, that at the end of World War I, uh, one, the Treaty of Versailles put extreme limits on uh, German military and e economy. This caused great degree of uh, freedom and problems. And uh, in the 30s, then Germany resumed as a military power. In the 1920s and 30s, the key technologies that were uh, very, very early development were ciphers. The uh, government code and cipher school had room 40, which was their uh, central decoding area. It had six people working in it. And in those days, the radio amateurs built their own equipment. So in this time period, uh, things were very, very basic. I shouldn't say primitive, but they had minimum resources, minimum effort. In the 1930s, things got serious because they could see the problems coming along in Europe. So they aggressively developed uh, uh, sci uh, uh, radar in the 1933 area on, and they put a major effort into breaking of machine ciphers, uh, leading to the foundation of Bletchley Park, which was the headquarters for all of the cipher breaking. So in the late 1930s, England formed a treaty with Poland that an attack on one is an attack on all. And on September 1st, 
1939, Germany invaded Poland, which activated this treaty. 15 days later, uh, England entered the war. The war was active in Eastern Europe for about nine months, and then the air attacks became uh, uh, active on England from uh, July 1940 on. During this time now, the uh, cipher interception and decoding became critical to uh, military strategy. During this time period, the US was by law required to be neutral, but it did offer supplies to England uh, and a convoy system was set up under the term of called Lend-Lease. And of course, as we know, the United States entered World War II on December 11th, 1941. So here's where we get interesting. Upon the declaration of war by England, September 2nd, 1939, British hams were required to surrender their radio transmitting equipment and their crystals. Uh, in those days, very, very few radios were uh, uh, adjustable transmit frequency. So they had to turn in crystals so they could not build a transmitter during World War II. The same effect went into the United States, but they didn't seize the equipment. But during all of World War II, radio amateurs were prohibited from transmitting. They wanted to keep the bands free, and they also wanted to be uh, identify potential illicit radio transmissions, quote, from spies. So at this time, the English government went out and requested radio amateurs monitor for spies. They were given an ID card, which meant that they could actually enter premises to investigate. So if a radio amateur had his ID card, he could knock on your door and demand to come in and check to see if you had any illicit radio transmitting equipment. They were searching for German spies. Guess what? No spies were heard. So they had these volunteer interceptors who were uh, authorized to listen to radio and to report messages. They had no spies, but all of a sudden there was a huge proliferation of coded Morse code messages, CW messages. So the bands began to light up with coded traffic having to do with the war. So these HAMS volunteers were recruited as interceptors, volunteer interceptors. They were mostly under or over military age. They were a student school, uh, older people retired, possibly people that had uh, jobs that uh, uh, avoided military service. And this ramped up to a total of 1,500 of these volunteer interceptors. They were recruited through the uh, uh, Royal Society of Great Britain. Most of them had homemade regenerative receivers. Again, remember this is the 20s and 30s. The, the receivers are typically super regenerative, uh, two or three tubes. Each interceptor was given in a frequency range and they hand recorded encrypted Morse code messages they received. They didn't know what the messages were, what they meant, where they were coming from, but anything that they heard on their frequency band was recorded and they mailed the messages into box 25 in Barnett in Hertfordshire. Uh, incidentally, the abbreviation for Hertfordshire is Hertz, H-E-R-T-S, and of course, that's our abbreviation for uh, frequencies today. Here's a picture of a typical receiver in those days. Eddie Stone was the Heath kit of the day from the 20s until the uh, about uh, 1955 or so, they were the primary supplier of kit form electronics and they made a, a wide range of uh, fully outfitted receivers too. A few notes, uh, the Germans used actually the English Morse code or CW abbreviations, which we'll mention in a minute. This was for two reasons. One was to be low profile so that in their communications, they really didn't use German. They used uh, the uh, international abbreviations and the encrypted messages. And also, uh, it does give a good brevity and clarity on recording the messages from both ends. So we'll see abbreviations in a moment, like SRI, which is sorry, PSE, which is please, call, and next, and then Q codes. Uh, there's a very elaborate set of Q codes. These days, the radio amateurs use about 10 or 15 basics, but there's a roughly 100 different Q codes that uh, 
Uh, QSA means what is my signal strength, QRK, Q, QTC, do you have uh, traffic for me, things like that. And we'll see in a moment, uh, uh, the word Bertie is a code name for Berlin. Uh, there were about six net control areas in Germany, and each one had an alphabetic abbreviation. And here we actually see a log sheet from 1941 that was done by a volunteer interceptor. At the top in a red circle, we see Bertie's, which meant this was from Berlin. In the uh, oval at the left, we see uh, QSA, which is what is my signal strength, and then PSA call, and then K means over to you. Then we see SRI, sorry, and more Q codes. At the center of the uh, red message is, are the, uh, is a coded message, five letter groups. Sometimes they were four letter groups, sometimes they were numbers. And the uh, receiving operator had no idea what it was. Uh, they would just record the frequency, the time of day, and the text they got. And these messages from these 1500 operators began to tumble into uh, what ended up being the uh, decryption people in Bletchley Park. So the volunteer interceptors grew into the RSS, the Radio Security Service, which was then the government employees. Uh, the hams from Radio Society of Great Britain, then some uh, became paid and went to work for the government. Otherwise, civilians were recruited and taught Morse code. At this time, if you knew Morse code, you could go into the RSS and you could avoid uh, getting into the active war and being shot at. By the end of the war, there were 2,000 interceptors operating on a staff of 3,000, roughly 1,000 support personnel. But can you imagine 1,000 sets of ears listening to shortwave radios to intercept foreign communication? The equipment they used, the gold standard was the national HRO receiver made in the United States. It was designed in the early 1930s by Herbert Hoover, Hoover Jr. in Pasadena in his garage. Now that was not Herbert Hoover, ex-president, but it was his son. So the son of the president co-designed the national HRO receiver. It was very advanced for its day. It was a nine tube superheterodyne. It had a, super, a separate power supply. So this way they could plug in a different power source, whether it be batteries, dynamo, dynamotor, vibrator, um, or uh, uh, mains powered. It had a plug in coil bank for band switching, which we'll see in just a moment. They did not like the uh, switching noise and uh, lead links and all from band switching. So this was a plug-in array that was shielded that did all the band switching. A key factor of it was it had a 10 turn dial on the front to cover the full frequency range. By using a 10 turn dial, they actually had 10 linear feet of calibrated band spread. A thousand of these ultimately were developed and purchased for the intercept service and roughly 10,000 were produced for the war effort. The United States uh, Department of War went to HRO, I went to National and said, you start building these as fast as you can and we'll tell you when to stop. And they went, of course, worldwide. The name HRO is, is an in, uh, is in the in-company joke. When the work orders went to the sheet metal part of the factory, they were marked hell of a rush order, HRO, hell of a rush order. And management thought that was a clever enough name that they actually named the receiver HRO. In today's money, the price of this receiver would be $4,500. And here's a picture of it. You can see the big dial in the center. It rotated and had little inset windows to keep track of the turns counting. It had a worm drive to the tuning capacitor on the inside. But again, 10 turns would cover the entire band. The two white squares at the bottom are the frequency calibration chart that, that translated from the uh, dial to the actual frequency. Here's an inside view. You can see it's very ruggedized. All the tubes are enclosed. They're in uh, for shielding and also for vibration resistance to pull down. And the bottom center is the band switching uh, uh, tuning assembly. The basic radio was supplied with four sets of uh, band switching plugins, A through D. It covered from 1.7 megahertz to 30. There were additional, there were about another 12 more that were produced over time for specialized frequency ranges. 
here's an intercept station. You can see there were three of these HR receivers and in the yellow circle at the, at the center, you can see a, the plug-in or a rack that held the unused uh, band switching uh, assemblies. So to change bands, you would take one out of the uh, upper assembly, plug it into the radio and take the one in the radio and put it back in the uh, top assembly. This is a typical intercept station, nothing fancy, just people with earphones on listening to radios. I assume the, ra the room would be eerily quiet when you walked in because everybody is on earphones. So radio security service, there were some 20 different sites that were uh, receive and trans and some on transmit. There were many more received than transmits. The stations that could transmit, they would locate the transmit station a mile or two miles away to reduce interference between uh, transmit and receive. These systems went three shifts a day, seven days a week around the clock. Here's a few of the operator positions in the uh, different sites. The hand slope, for example, had 33 operator positions. That meant there could be 33 receivers at the same time, and each position had two of those HRO receivers. They wanted to be able to hear the net control as well as the field stations, and they would be on different frequencies. So each interceptor had uh, two radios. As I said, there were some thousand receivers in use. At one site, there would typically be 10 to 35 operator positions, each with two radios, seven rhombic antennas, 50 feet up in the air, beam antennas at 75 feet, and then many uh, wire antennas. These generally would be fed into wideband amplifiers so that more than one receiver could use the antenna. Here's the results. It's estimated there were 500,000 intercepts of these, about 97,000 were the Abwehr hand code from German intelligence. These were hand coded and rather easy to break. Uh, in the hundreds of thousands were the Enigma machine ciphers that went through several generations and presented uh, increasing difficulty in breaking. Especially Park, the code breakers, started out with a staff of, uh, of about 30 people. And by the end of the war, it had a hundred that had 10,000 people operating in code breaking. Uh, there were some 30 different codes in use. Some they could master, some they could not. Uh, they expanded to the point where they were actually working on breaking Japanese codes also. And they had a close partnership with the United States in those days. Fascinating story. There's quite a number of books on this. The decoded output was known as ULTRA which is a level above top secret. It was handled very, very closely because they didn't want to let the Germans know they were reading their messages. And they were sent generally by uh, private channels to uh, field operations at the general level. Those of you who, who might have bumped onto it when I did my first meta compiler, it was named Ultra. And a few people in those days knew when, when I talked about my ultra compiler, they would smile knowingly that it was taken from the uh, code breaking of this day. So to summarize, the code breaking and code intercept had a major impact in the campaigns in North Africa and in Greece and in combating the bombing of uh, Britain itself. It was particularly important in the battle for the Atlantic, which was to uh, protect and intercept the uh, uh, convoys that were going from the United States to England. Uh, this was focused on the submarine warfare. Uh, and another element of it was kind of amazing. During the war, about 20 to, th to 30 German spies entered England. They were caught rather immediately and they were put into a service called Double X, Double Cross in which the German spy traffic was fed back to England by the, by the British themselves. So they would make up fake messages and then send them back to England. And so, England, uh, so Germany thought their spies were still in operation. And finally, uh, leading up to D-Day, there was a major uh, impact from code breaking. After D-Day, the code breaking became much less important because now it was battlefield tactical and the, break, the time to break messages went from hours to a few days and there was a time delay in getting into the field. So the code breaking was great from a strategic standpoint, long range capability and all that, 
but less important uh, later in the war. An important summary is that technology, both radar and message decryption, reduced World War II by at least two years. Uh, Churchill gave tremendous support to this effort. You can see from having 10,000 people, they had a, a joint effort to the United States. The United States actually, through National Trash Cash Register, was, was building decryption machines called bombs. A huge effort in this area. And um, it, it really, if when you know where the enemy is and what his resources are, it's a tremendous asset. So do we have any uh, 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 comment, questions or comments? Do you know, Bill, one, one thing that, that made me wonder is um, in terms of frequency ranges, um, uh, you know, how, how, how effective was the coverage? Uh, you know, how much did, did the Germans sort of uh, fiddle around with what frequency to transmit on things of that sort? They were using the core uh, frequencies that we would uh, today shortwave, uh, typically um, 40 meters and 20 meters. And, um, you know, from uh, seven megahertz to, to 14 to 20 to 24. Uh, just haven't, as, they, was, haven't they implemented an Enigma machine in fourth or in some other language? I heard that somebody had an emulation of an Enigma machine. Uh, what do you know about that? Go go ahead. Yeah, you'll see one. That's my next talk. So this this whole talk on Intercept was leading up to the fourth talk on, on a simulated uh -huh. Enigma machine. So that's that's what comes next. I knew um, it would come to that. Okay. Now, the uh, the submarines typically would report twice a day, once at midnight and once at noon, and so they could choose the frequencies they operated on based on what was effective at that time of day. Um, Didn't they? Uh, they used at the end of each message there was a message of Heil Hitler, and it was that was the main key that Bletchley Park used in helping. Uh, decode the messages uh, back in the day. That certainly is the case. Um, to do the decryption, they needed to know at least some fragment uh, of what the message content was. And um, we call them tips. And Heil Hitler was a good one. And other ones would be at the introduction. Uh, you know, they, typically messages were stylized and they would use the same kind of opening. So to do the decryption, they, they had to have a target on what they were looking for. Yeah, also, also uh, German, German has a lot of double letters that are pretty commonly used. So, so that was also used as part of that uh, uh, figuring out things. I wanted to ask one question about the receivers. Uh, they were just single conversion or... Uh, these, no, they're uh, double conversion, double conversion. And the okay. German language was very phonetic, and that was another really good key to deciphering them as well. Yeah. I'm wondering, after they decoded the message, how did they send it to headquarters without getting compromised? Yeah. There is a dark period in this uh, from the British standpoint from the spring of, of 1942 to about October 1942, uh, the Germans changed the design of the machine. And so the, the British went dark for this time period. And uh, this was also when the submarine warfare reached its peak. Uh, and so finally, at, uh, in, the, in the fall of 42, they developed methods against the uh, German improvements. And uh, so can you imagine coming into work every day for eight or nine months and, and not being able to achieve your job function day after day after day after day for nine months until finally uh, Turing's work on electromechanical uh, decoding uh, came to fruition. Um, let's see, uh, Dave, do you have any comments or shall I continue right into the next presentation? Um, yeah, just uh, continue on if... Um... If uh, nobody else has any questions about what you just spoke about, I do have a, a, a question or at least a comment. I'm curious to hear uh, if Bill looked into this at all. The, the thing that got me about all of this was that 
I know for a fact that there were times when they decoded messages that let them know that a particular outpost or ship or whatever was going to be attacked. But if they had responded to protect that particular asset, then the Germans would have understood that we had, or that they had broken their codes. And so they then let those people die, uh, let them be attacked or overrun by the Germans in order to keep the secret and, and in order to continue being able to decode those messages in the future and therefore, you know, hopefully save many more lives in the, in the long run. It's that, it's that thing about how knowledge can be very, very painful. And I was curious if, if you had read anything about the psychological effects to people who were involved in those decisions or who knew what was going on, maybe the people who decoded it and then later found out that even though they had decoded the message and passed up the command, there, you know, that that ship was still destroyed. Yeah, they had to be very, very careful not to let the Germans know that they knew how to decrypt their messages. Otherwise, it would just be totally, you know, uh, in, ineffective at that point once they caught on, you know. Uh, uh, Britain required they required the Germans know there was some reason for an activity other than the decryption. So they required that they either had to have uh, uh, aerial reconnaissance, radar, another ship. So somewhere the Germans had to have a logical reason why they were attacked at a given place. Uh, and in one case, there was a, a German group of seven ships the British attacked them and they they sunk five of the seven and they let the other two go because they didn't want the Germans to know, you know that they had tracked where they were. So they intentionally let two ships go, go by so it was not 100% effective. And then to their dismay, some other British ships stumbled on those other two ships by accident and sunk them also. And so they were really worried the Germans were going to to uh, discover this. In the books written on this, uh, there is mention of the, the uh, moral dilemmas that they faced in intentionally letting uh, ships go by, uh, not taking action, in particular with the convoys. In other words, there were cases where convoys were not redirected be, uh, around the German wolf packs because, again, they didn't want to appear to be uh, too much in control. So um, there's more than a few ethical dilemmas associated with war. So let's go on to. Yeah. Uh, let me let me inter introduce the uh, next talk. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, Bill's going to continue um, um, and have a fourth component introduced in this talk called the Enigma of Fourth Programming the Enigma Cipher Machine. So take it away. Okay. Do, do, do. All right. Are we getting the the uh, screen proper? Yes. Right. Uh, didn't they capture an Enigma machine during the war? Uh, at the very last slide, very last slide today, you will see a very interesting point on that. But they did, they captured a number of them. And in fact, uh, during time periods when they were having trouble breaking the codes, uh, they actually staged military efforts to go capture uh, cryptographic equipment. Um, and they were, just, they were successful a number of times. So um, equipment captures played a key part in uh, some of their effort. So today, the background on the Enigma cipher machine, it was invented in the 1920s, patented. A couple of companies had 
sort of variations on it. Um, but uh, in the late 20s, it became uh, widespread use in German military. And in the 30s, it was adopted as the government military communications uh, backbone. Through the 30s, there was a joint effort between Poland and England to intercept and decode radio communications. The Polish actually were well ahead of the British. There were a couple of joint meetings, and finally the British realized that the Polish had solved problems that, that they uh, had not been able to solve, and a, a joint effort was set up. The Polish uh, codebreakers actually built a replica Enigma machine without ever seeing one. Uh, they did the analyst analysis of the coding methods and reconstructed the thing internally and made a, a model of it without ever actually seeing the original. However, the, the, the changes in encryption exceeded the capacity that Poland could cope with. It got more and more complicated, more and more people. And in Poland, they only had three people working on this. So finally, they turned it over to England because England had a, a much higher investment and in staffing. Here's a picture of the original Enigma machine, a uh, three-rotor machine, portable, weighed 25 pounds. There was an earlier version that would do printing, but it was heavy, bulky, and unreliable. So the workhorse machine was exactly as we see here. It had four components, a keyboard. You would push the keys one at a time. The electrical signal would then go through the plug board, which is down at the, at the bottom front. Those signals would then go to the scrambler or the rotors. They would go through uh, electrical circuits, which we'll see, and they would light a lamp. So you'd press a button, a, a typewriter key, a light would light on the lamp display, and then the rotors would increment to another position. This Enigma 1 machine, manufactured in the early 1940s for the German Wehrmacht, comes in its original oak case. When I unscrew the locking bolts and lift the hinged lid, the battery compartment is visible on the right. The stator, the three rotors, and the reflector, lettered with a B in red, are visible. Before a message was encoded, these had to be removed and programmed according to the settings for the given day. I lift out the three rotors on their spindle and slide each one off. On the right side of this rotor, note the 26 brass electrical contacts and the adjustable ring, and on the left, the Bakelite thumb wheel. I adjust the ring setting on one of the rotors and reassemble the three rotors in a new order on the spindle. Each rotor has an identifying Roman rotor number. Finally, I reinsert the rotors on the spindle and lock the entire assembly in place. Note how the rightmost rotor advances with each keystroke. After one full revolution, the rotor to the left will advance by one position, resetting the pattern of the electrical contacts. A further level of security is provided by the front plug board or steckerbrett. There are 26 double sockets and 13 cables, each with two pins. The German military generally used 10 cables. Here, all 13 are attached. Finally, I close the machine lid and the front flap of the case to ensure that the cables are correctly positioned. Next, we set the power supply to external and set the rotors to the three-letter key for the day. Let's type in the word enigma. When the E is pressed, the bulb for J turns on and the right hand rotor advances one increment. Similarly, N becomes T, I, R, G, B, M, E, and A, C. In this segment, we see how the rotor turns with each keystroke. The Wehrmacht version of the Enigma machine used numbered positions for each letter, not the letters themselves. Each number corresponds to a letter of the alphabet. A is 01, B 02, and so on. To decode, I reset the rotors to the initial position. In practice, the operator would provide a new encoded setting in the message. Note how in decipherment, J becomes E, the TN, the RI, until our original one word plain text, Enigma, is revealed. 
We'll see some of the uh, interior assembly. This is the rotor assembly. The early Enigmas had three, the later uh, Enigmas had four. Exploded view. You can see there um, uh, was, a number, was a number of circular components that all fit together. And in the center was a little cage of wiring. So you had uh, 26 input terminals, 26 output terminals, and they were wired together in essentially a random fashion. Here's a photograph of the actual of an actual rotor. Uh, there were spring-loaded brass contacts in one direction, which would, would, would press rotor to rotor. And at the uh, right, we can see the uh, little basket of wiring. This is the electrical path that we're going to emulate in the fourth program. When you hit the letter A, which is in the square at the top, it would go through the wiring of three rotors. It would hit the left, which is a reflector, and that would turn the uh, electrical path back 180 degrees, and you would go through the three rotors in a different path. So there were six possibilities of change through the rotors, uh, two in each. The letter uh, A, uh, just a second. The le letter A would, uh, you press letter A, it goes through the whole sequence, and out would come a letter G. Uh, and then at the next keystroke, uh, the rotor would change. Uh, now, uh, go ahead uh, for the question. <laughs> yeah, it had a battery, right? What type of battery was it? It was a dry cell battery at four volts. And uh, they could well, operate. Three, well, yeah, like three, uh, uh, three uh, type D cells or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah except that they were, that's correct. Um, they also could plug into external power, but um, it was, I believe it was, um, uh, the cells were 2.2 volt cells, so two together would be 4.4 volts. Uh, now here's a manual analysis. I did this to be checking the software. So at the, uh, at the left, you see the letter F with a square around it. So I am going to try to encode manually the letter F it goes down to a circle zero at the first position, zero links over toward the left to the reflector. The reflector links to position 13. Position 13 at the bottom links to 12. 12 links to the bottom to the letter M. So this means that letter F will encode to the letter M. Now this is one rotor only. Remember that this is done through three separate rotors. The letter M has a square box around it and it links to position 13. Position 13 on the reflector links to position zero. Uh, at the bottom left, position zero links to five. And at the output, uh, position five links to the letter F. So M goes to F. This is a key part, a very important part of why this was such a practical machine, was that in this case, the letter F would encode to uh, M and M would encode to F. So what it means is, to receive the message, you just have the same setting as they used to transmit, and you run the receive message through the machine uh, at the receiving end, and it will get the plain text out. So this was symmetrical. The encoding in was mirrored to the encode to the uh, output message. So I developed this little yeah. sheet, uh, which I had to use for uh, checking my software. And um, the, the uh, British analyst used something very similar. The center square that has a, a row, six rows of numbers with a square around it are the offset positions of the rotor as you go through letter by letter by letter. The British would put these on thin strips of cardboard. And when they were analyzing messages, one of the elements then was to simulate the rotor positions and the rotor action with these sliding strips of cardboard. Now we're to the fourth. We want to encode one letter. And we're gonna look at one letter through one rotor. So the output letter was actually a function of four things. Number one is the rotor, and they were interchangeable. So you needed to know which rotor was being used, the rotor position, the input letter being encoded, and then the wiring, which transferred from rotor to rotor. At the bottom is through a rotor. This is the uh, fourth coding. The input was the forward rotor, which was in slot three, the rotor position, which is in the slot three, those numbers were then passed down and the, the fourth arithmetic took place, which would develop the position, the transfer and the output. 
So here's what would happen after one advance. At the beginning, we saw that A would encode to G. After one rotor advanced, then uh, A would go through an entirely different pattern and would encode as C. So this meant you had a different alphabet being used on every rotation. Here's an example of the, the uh, offsetting at position three coming up right now. All three rotors change position. This is a beautiful wooden example. I'll, uh, I'll show this again so you can see how the rotors carry from rotor to rotor. The one on the left, uh, when it hits position three, all three rotors will, will transfer. 26, there's one, two, three, click, all rotors transfer. Here's a, an analysis of the turnover going from rotor to rotor. Uh, the carries went toward the left. So it started at slot three, would carry to slot two, slot one. So we can see on rotor three, the positions are 20, 21, 22, and 23. When 23 is reached, the rotor two transfers from five to zero, and rotor one transfers from three to four. The fourth code that does this at the end of each input, when the entry is complete, the uh, entry complete word executes. So at that point, the rotor position at slot three is, is, is incremented, stored back in the rotor position to three, and it is compared to the turnover number. And if the turnover number and the rotor position are equal, then the if executes, and the rotor position two is tested. Rotor position two is incremented and is tested for its turnover. and when that becomes true, then the, uh, the slot number one rotor is, is um, incremented. There's the D chart of that logic, pretty simple. Again, we increment slot one. If it's a turnover, yes, we increment slot two. If that's in a turnover, we increment slot three. Here's our internal representation of the rotors as uh, fourth words. There are arrays, there are byte arrays, so since there are two independent separate, or there, since there are two wiring paths in here, we have to have one array, which is the uh, offsets in the forward direction called rotor A forward. And then we have a second one, which is rotor A reverse. And if you notice, the numbers are mirror images. Wherever there's a plus on the first section, there's a minus on the bottom and vice versa. So in this case, from position zero through 25, the one, 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 one means it's an offset by just one position. And then the five has a minus five. And so that loops back um, to position zero. In practice, the uh, actual encoding or scrambling would be much more complicated, essentially random numbers. But in this case, I did them very systematically because remember, I'm having to use uh, manual longhand uh, calculations to, or, uh, to check to make sure it's operating properly. So we put in some simple test cases. The reflector in this case um, just offsets by 13 positions. So if you if the signal comes in on reflector position zero, it will go out 13 positions later, which is number 13. If it comes in on one, it'll go out 13 positions later, which is 14, and so on. Again, um, super simple, and in practice, these will be scrambled randomly. So a key element is the definition of a particular, what's in a particular slot. In a particular slot, we need to know what rotor is forward, what rotor is reverse. We need to know its position. And then we need to know at what position it will turn over or carry to the next rotor. Definitions are very simple. It's create does. We create the uh, named rotor and the lot four cells for its parameters. When a given slot is executed by name, its base address will be added to an increment on the stack. This is a simple database where uh, each slot uh, uh, accesses its field by a particular offset. So now we just define the slots. We define slot one, two, and three, define the reflector. And in here also is the uh, plug board, which are those wiring variations and the keyboard itself. 
because the keyboards can be wired in uh, different locations. Um, in my uh, models here, I'm not the uh, the plug board is implemented, but I'm not showing in the demonstrations for uh, uh, clarity. Each rotor uh, has four data fields. These are defined as constants. So the first data field is which rotor uh, forward is being used. It's the uh, the code field address of that rotor. The second is the rotor reverse. The second is an integer for the rotor position and an integer for the turnover position. An Enigma operator would go through the center procedure. First, he has to determine which rotor is in which slot. Initially, there were three rotors, then they went to five rotors, then they went to eight. Uh, with three rotors, there are only six combinations. With five rotors, uh, there are 30 combinations. And with eight rotors, there are 335 combinations. Through the war, this made decryption more difficult. It would set the initial position of the rotor, the turnover point of each rotor, and then the setting for that particular message, and then the plug board settings. Some of these information would be put out on a monthly basis. So the uh, field operators would get a monthly sheet that had the, the uh, settings, and then the operator would then pick the positions uh, for each rotor for each, each uh, specific message. This is what an operator goes through in setting up a machine. This is our start. The operator then takes rotor A, puts it in slot one, in this case, for fourth, we need to know what the reverse pattern is, it goes into slot one, the rotor position in slot two is set, and the rotor turnover. In this case, all of these are set to zero, again, for clarity and for uh, debugging and testing. But in actual operation, all of these are variables. The operator would pick the uh, slot number, the rotor position, and the turnover for all three slots, or in some cases, four. And we see now encrypting a letter. Well, it's just what you'd imagine for fourth. We can encrypt one letter. We have a letter in, a letter out. These are integers. I use zero to 25, uh, fourth like. They uh, could be uh, alphabetic and they could go one to 26 or they could just be letters of the alphabet. I chose integers zero to 25. So the data comes from uh, in slot one, what is the rotor in slot one and what is the rotor position? And then one level goes through the, uh, the uh, calculation to get the output position. In other words, one level is taking care of the translation from A to G. That electrical signal then goes through slot one, the two through slot one through the reflector and back again. And then finally at the end, entry complete increments the rotors. Very clear, very forth like and it's an exact analog of the machine. So here's a sample setup for a test. Uh, we put out start, which initializes all of the variables. We'll set rotor position five to rotor position in slot one. We'll set 12 to the rotor turnover in slot one. Put five for slot two, six for slot two, and finally rotor position 20 for slot one and 21 for the turnover. And then we'll just execute an alpha test routine. The alpha test routine just sends the entire alphabet uh, A through Z. So at the left, we see the letter N. And again, this message has 26 inputs, let alphabet A through Z. The second column is the uh, numeric code. And then we see the rotor positions all the way through from three, two, one, reflector, one, two, three, and output. The green arrows show us that for an input of P, we'll get an output of I. So the input P is number 15, and the output I is um, number eight. This is a shortened version of the same thing. We actually see the rotor positions. So at the top left at the green, we see that when the rotors are in position 20, 5, and 11, upon the next letter input, all three increment and the rotors go 21, 6, and 12. Now notice, I picked this case so all three rotors are incrementing at the same time. Normally, only rotor three increments. After 26 increments, then it carries to rotor two and so on. In the center in the blue, we see that an input of five alphabetic gives output of eight. And as a check figure, I, I code and decode 
So I want to make sure that the uh, check figure is the same as the input. In this case, I've encoded from P produces letter I, letter I decrypted goes to letter P. There's some small words that kind of glue this operation together. Um, one of the simple ones is to convert an ASCII letter to an integer. We just subtract the ASCII value of A to convert the integer back to ASCII. We just add the ASCII value back again. Uh, an interesting point that I hit would be that I am using byte storage for these rotor values. When you do, when you do arithmetic on them, you, you cannot mix byte values with 32 or 32 bit cell values uh, from a negative standpoint, they, uh, they don't work. And I scratched my head on that for a little bit and I realized I had to sign extend from the byte values to a full 32 bit. So the sign extension is simply uh, testing the byte sign, which at bit position uh, in decimal 128. And if that bit is set, we then or, or onto this a hexadecimal FFFFF, which does a sign extend to 32 bits. Uh, thinking back to the old days, I had to get paper and pencil and worked out about three different ways to do this and got a, down the memory trail of what, how the number circles work. Another one element is that all these rotors have 20, 26 positions. So a lot of the arithmetic has a modular arithmetic that uh, by sitting, simply saying number of letters, which is 26, mod, the rotors, uh, the negative rotor positions are automatically converted to positive. Let's see how we sample encode. The encoding is that we have messages in the uh, sample in. Sample in is a message and sample out is workspace. So sample out, we erase it. Then we go start, which sets up the machine. Then sample out, sample in, and count sets up a do loop. For the do loop over 26 letters, we get uh, the input letter. Uh, it is encoded by letter A. We then store that in output. And then the last line uh, keeps track of uh, which letter we've encoded. So that executes 26 times. So we've encoded the full alphabet. The decoding is a mirror image. Uh, instead of, um, in, uh, we have the output message goes is, is read now, and it then goes to a check message from the output. So the first session we go in to out, the second we go to out to check. Everything else is the same. We notice the code is the same because this machine is symmetrical. So here's some examples, plain text. Originally, I was going to use the first Morse code message, which, uh, which was sent transcontinentally, which is what hath God wrought. That's too short a message. So instead, I take Mr. Watson, come here, I want to see you. This was from the notebook of Alexander Graham Bell as the first message that was sent by a uh, voice telephone. To transmit it, the words need to be separated, and the uh, common method is to put the letter X in between. So the Germans use the letter X between words, and they use the Y for end of sentence. At the end here, you'll see there are three X's because this needed to be padded out to a total of, um, uh, of uh, five, uh, even, even a five letters per code group. Run through this encryption. The encoding would be the scrambled letters we see down below. As it was transmitted, it would be set, separated into five letter code groups. And then at the receiving end, the five letter code groups are mushed together to make the full text message. And here is decryption. So we got back to Mr. Watson, come here, I want to see you. Look at the performance. The encoding, which is that top line, takes place in 62 microseconds. And the decoding is 61 microseconds, essentially the same due to a little quantizing error. So 61 microseconds to handle one message. Here's what's quite interesting. The code breakers in Bletchley Clark used manual and electromechanical methods, which took them days to go through some of these comparisons. In this case, with the basic rotor Enigma machine, it will go through all 1 million combinations in a minute, 34 seconds. So this makes, 
code breaking of this style uh, trivial with the simplest uh, Enigma machines. You go through all combinations and you just look for the lot of letter X's and a lot of letter E's. You, when you said a lot of E's, a lot of X's, that's the message. However, it gets stickier. By the end of the war, there was a four rotor Enigma that had the plug board and it had variable turnover positions. And so the number of encoded message combinations becomes quite large. It's two, it's 26 to six times 366, or roughly 10th of the 11th combinations. I did a back of the paper calculation on my setup to run through all of these combinations would take, on my computer would take 2.8 years. So in this case, solving exhaustively is not practical. So in summary, with analysis, lots of messages, electromechanical aids, and German operator errors, most of the messages were read through the entire war. Only there were three different cipher systems in use. Some were Enigma, and many of them were other coding methods in Bletchley, Bletchley Park uh, Act work after all of them. Operator errors were a key part of code breaking. A typical operator error would be sending the same message twice in a row with different settings or sending the same message by two different encoding schemes. And the the Bletchley Park would scan over, 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 looking for whenever an error occurred that they could take advantage of. So as I mentioned, the original decoding was done with sliding rods. It depended on technical discoveries, innovation, cleverness, and German operator errors. Later on, as I mentioned, the, uh, the, the Enigma expanded to poor slots and eight rotors and caused major problems. However, Building on the work from the Polish, they developed electromechanical uh, machines, and only through the war they made about about 40 of these. Some were in the United States and some were in England. Most of the later ones were made by National Cash Register in Dayton, Ohio. And in the worst case, this could break in about 60 hours, and then once they had the major settings, they could break a code message in less than one hour. So the Enigma itself went through a number of production variations. If you go on Wikipedia on the internet, you can see the history of this. After the war, the Enigma encryption was some, used by some parties uh, up until the 1960s or so, uh, not by the military, not by Germany, but it was used typically by um, embassy uh, government communications. The decryption was, was a top secret in Brit Britain until 1974 and the Bletchley Park people had hammered into them that uh, they could be executed and shot if they told anybody about what they did during the war, revealing secrets. And finally, it was uh, uh, the first re uh, uh, information came out in 74. And since then, I'm estimating some 20 different books have been written by the people who were actually in Bletchley Park. And uh, you will find online uh, software implementations for the uh, use of this. If you wanted to go use the Enigma encoding process, you can find um, typical um, you know, uh, Python and C and so on uh, emulations for the process. Um, here is the last piece of information on this. In February of this year, only four or five months ago, some divers were in the North Atlantic recovering fishing nets off the ocean bottom to protect the fish life. And the divers stumbled onto what one of them said was a typewriter. He said, I think I found a typewriter over there. So they hauled the typewriter up to the surface and somebody looked at it and recognized it and said, wait a minute, this is a cipher machine from World War II. The, um, the methods of U-boats, which were the biggest risk for capture of a machine, was they would take the machine out and throw it into the water. And in fact, they had a weighted bag with lead plates in it that would uh, reduce the buoyancy. So you'd put the, the Enigma in the bag with the lead plates, throw it overboard, and then likewise throw the rotors overboard. Uh, however, captures were made. And this is one of the Enigmas that had been apparently abandoned and, and hit the ocean bottom. So what we see today is a, 
a brief history of World War II, some of the technology that went into World War II, uh, the key factors that uh, decryption played, and then a way in forth to do the encryption. If you want the source code of this, go to GitHub, my name, Bill Ragsdale, and look under fourth projects and you'll see Enigma. And for those who wish more information, uh, there's a wealth of information on this uh, under Enigma. If you go Enigma machine or Enigma rotors, you can actually get the original encoding of the German rotors. So you can build a, an exact replica of the coding that they used in World War II. Do we have any questions? Yes. I have a question. Uh, what the rotor forward versus rotor reverse? You said it was something about the discs could be put in backwards. I, I'm I'm sorry, I must have missed something, but I don't understand how that disc could possibly be put in backwards. No, um, the the rotor forward and reverse was only a convenience for the fourth program. The rotors were always uh, uniformly placed, but. The circuit, uh, the offsets are um, plus in one direction and minus in the other direction. So. Oh, it was the way that the disc was wired. <laughs> yeah, oh, the, yeah, or, yeah. The, rotor, the rotor reverses the direction so that the electricity flows in left to right, goes through the rotor and comes back right to left. And so I needed to make a replica of the reverse direction for fourth as well as the forward direction. That okay, so so basically you were you were doing that so that one entry was for uh, was for the path through in one direction and the other entry was for for the path through back in the other direction. That's correct. Here here are the rotors in fourth. So you see that in the forward direction the the numbers are all like one 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 one. And in the reverse direction, they are minus one, minus one, minus one. Okay. All right. Thank you. I, I, I appreciate your explanation. Great and, presentation, by the way, Bill. The history was interesting, and the machine was interesting, and the fourth implementation was interesting okay, as well. Thank you. Uh, in the interest of precision and less work, I wrote a little quick fourth word. So I would put in the forward rotor, and then I would execute a fourth word which would generate the second array with the uh, proper signs and, and directions. So um, any other questions? Uh, on that same theme, Bill, one thing I, I wondered, you know, with the board in reverse, um, the, it seems like the possibility that you would collide, you know, with the same letters coming backwards through. Is there some intuition as to why that doesn't happen? You were breaking up on that. I really couldn't understand. Try again. So, so uh, with the with going through the wiring in the forward direction and then coming back in reverse, is there some intuition for, for why a collision doesn't happen with the, the letters? Uh, yeah, each wire is unique. It comes in. Uh, there are 26 input positions, 26 output positions, and um, they're one for, they're one for one. Um, now, notice, notice what the reflector does. The reflector takes it in on one of 26 positions, puts it out on a different position. And so a, a letter cannot reflect on itself. I see. I see. Yes, that makes sense. Yeah, that was actually that was actually used as part of their of their check to make sure that they had their, their stuff set up right. If it if it came out that they had the had the same letter, then they then they knew that was wrong. This, you know, this is on the code breaking, right? And yes, in yes. The code, in the code breaking, um, and for one generation of code breaking, they had a logic table that had about eight or nine steps, and they were looking for logical contradictions to rule out settings. And one of those contradictions would be the same letter uh, encoded twice. One German operator one time sent a message that was entirely the letter L. L, 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 all the way through. And when this hit Bletchley Park, one of the lady operators saw this and just scratching her head looked at it and just, she just looked at the printout and said, there's no letter L in this message, what is it? And they realized the operator had sent 
all else, so none would appear in the message. They use that as a, as a way to attract, uh, attack um, the wiring or the information. So the, the tricks they used were unique, clever. Um, you're trying to attack something that has a million settings and reduce it to one. And um, of course, typically they would need uh, 50 messages or so to be able to find patterns or errors or to get started. And then once they, once they got the basic configuration, uh, then they could attack individual messages and uh, successfully even by hand methods in a few hours. Anything else? All right, we go back to uh, control center. Uh, Dave, you've got the con. Okay, Bill, thank you so much. That was really, really interesting. Um, I think the uh, Computer History Museum has an Enigma machine, and uh, one of my one of my buddies um, I know had one personally. Um, yeah, I spent a lot of time studying the Enigma, Enigma machine myself. I was fascinated by it. Mm -hmm. Okay, Thanks. there were tens of thousands of them made, and Germany had actually three factories building them. Three different factories making them. Uh, they probably were what we call workshops, small factories, but uh, tens of thousands were made. And um, um, but try to get one today. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, right. Um, I'm going to put in the links uh, the Crypto Museum, which um, has a lot of information about the Enigma machines and um, uh, um, uh, it's just a, a wealth of uh, history and um, um, and articles. So uh, uh, yeah, they got one in the Spy Museum in Washington D.C., and I think they have one in the Atomic Testing Museum here in Las Vegas.